Thanks. Um, so, I uh, hope you still have some energy for this lightweight topic we have to, to go on. Um, as we already heard, uh, like Thomas said, uh, building multilingual sites is a fun thing to do. And, and something that we here in Finland often, often have to do or can do. Uh, my name is Janne Alajela and the first step I step on uh, multilingual sites is to use polylang. Um, I'm not going to go for the further uh, on different multilingual plugins uh, because uh, as Daniel said there were an excellent talk in last year WordCamp Finland that you can see on wordfresh.tv and if you want to do and learn uh, multilingual stuff there is a workshop available tomorrow uh, so what are we going to talk today uh, the admin workflow uh, it seems to be be the thing this year then some theming stuff and the last section will be about working with a uh, non-Latin alphabet. So, the first one. Uh, oh, blimey. Back. Back. Oh, so, the translation workflow uh, for the, our clients, the administrator users of the site. Um, there is an, uh, not a clear solution for this one. This is something that uh, you need to talk with your clients, uh, plan with them how they intend to actually manage their translations. Uh, who is the person who makes the translation? Who is the one who adds them uh, from where they come from? And, and uh, how they fit uh, together in different language versions of the site. So, uh, talk with your client. Uh, one example of uh, parts that you need to talk with them uh, is copying content from the original tr post version uh, when they add a new translation. Um, uh, WPML uh, has an option for this by default. Uh, Polyline can be extended to have this feature. My colleague Teemu Suoranta back there has developed a plugin for this that's available at our GitHub account. Um, and if you really want to use uh, copying the content from the as a base to the new translations, uh, that depends quite a lot on the client's workflow of managing the translations. So once again, talk with your clients. A small thing, show <laughs> the uh, content editors how they can change the administration language. Uh, especially if you have a big multilingual team managing the translations, uh, there are pr probably different native language uh, users among them, and, and by default the WordPress uh, sets the administration side uh, for, as the side default language, but uh, both Polylang and WPML have this feature when on the user profile page they can change the language. Widgets. Uh, in general uh, I have found that uh, widgets are a thing that uh, is a, a little bit hard concept to understand for our clients using the sites. And if we uh, add, let's say, few visibility rules and the translations to the widget UI, uh, most of uh, the clients <laughs> hate the widget UI. So. Uh, I, I'm not saying not to use widgets at all, but uh, if especially the ones that the client is 
ha going to edit. And uh, the more languages you have, the more difficult the widget administration goes, because I, I, I think there is no, no easy way to handle the widget tra translations. That actually would be better uh, in user experience view. Uh, what to use instead? Uh, custom fields, custom post types, uh, site option pages, uh, translatable theme strings, uh, and stuff like that. Then, on multilingual themes. Um, I thought that I wouldn't actually have to mention this, but uh, it's quite often to see something like this in the actual site's code. Uh, I, and I think at least they should have used a switch. Um, what uh, we are taught to do is to use the WordPress default translation functions, like lodash e and lodash lodash and etc. Uh, where you pass on the string you want to translate uh, and the text domain uh, to isolate the different translation uh, to own contexts. But um, this leads us to the PO and MO files uh, that, in my opinion, are awful. I haven't uh, yet met a developer uh, who thinks that these PO and MO files are nice to work with. Mm. Uh, editing them is a little bit hard. That's something that uh, is quite separate from the rest of the development. And PO and MO files are something that uh, no clients wants to edit, or uh, actually it's, I think it's quite impossible them for to edit. Uh, and uh, one big thing in PoMO files and using the default translation functions is that we can change the original English text without invalidating all the translations. Uh, so in case we have a site that's available in Finnish and Swedish, uh, we usually make the strings on our theme in English and add the Finnish and Swedish translations. Uh, but if the client wants to add the English translation later, uh, and we and they want to use some different English strings that we have originally used. Uh, it's uh, we have to have to do all the Finnish and Swedish translations again since we are invalidating the original string. And uh, the reason why the WordPress uses the PO and MO files at all is that they derive to the get text protocol. Yeah, available in PHP, uh, but the, as I will show you soon, the uh, performance on these files is oh, bad. So not even a performance point of view, this, these PO and MO files are, are good. Uh, there is uh, obviously a good place for PO and MO files. If you are developing a plugin or a commercial team for sale, it's, it's a good way to add the translations in your package. Uh, so, the plugin way. Uh, this is uh, the Polylang's version of Flow-E. Uh, there is also for the other translation functions the similar ones. And uh, also the WPML has a similar system for handling translations. Uh, this way, we can manage the translations in the admin. UI and also let our clients to edit them. Uh, so let's, uh, last year we built a site with uh, around 30, 30 languages uh, and, and it's really nice that the client can change the languages themselves, all the translations. Uh, and one nice feature of, is that you can change the original string uh, or override it. Uh, and uh, we have taken this a bit further and uh, we usually in our themes uh, adjust our placeholder texts 
as the base text. So like header, call to action button text. Oh, and then we don't have to actually know the English version of the text beforehand. Also, the, this feature can be used for other th strings than visible user interface text, like uh, date formats, uh, like call to action button links, text in, in footer. Uh, we usually, uh, uh, the copyright text on footer are, used to be widgets, so they could be edited on the admin, but nowadays we usually add them as translatable strings, so we don't have that many widgets areas to manage. Uh, there is obviously the downside that the translations are stored in database, uh, so it's harder to move, move them from another environment to another, but I think that's uh, only a little downside. And I think there, someone should actually write a plugin so we can move them along. And for to be sure that uh, we don't break everything, we use fallbacks. So in our theme, we add these uh, fallback functions that uh, fallback the polylang translation functions to the default uh, translation functions. So uh, if you're developing a theme for sale, you could actually make the theme uh, polylang or WPML compatible by adding these functions. Then it's time to bring in some unicorns. Um, and to be honest, this has quite a little to do with multilingual sites, but uh, it has a lot to do with sites that are not in English. Uh, we, here we have a page generation times for different WordPress installations. Uh, let's start with the default install. No plugins at all, 2016 theme, just the default content that is brought with the installation. Uh, pretty decent lamps, lamp stack. Uh, so the uh, front page generation, page generation time is uh, 26 milliseconds. And uh, yeah, on the admin side, the new post page is 47 milliseconds. Uh, wh when uh, we change the site language to Finnish, so no multilingual stuff, just uh, changing the site base language to Finnish, the front page generation time pumps up uh, to 37 milliseconds. That's percent, 42 percent bump. And on the admin side, the difference is even bigger. Uh, and if we take this a little bit closer to the real world, uh, we have an installation with uh, 15 popular plugins, like uh, SEO stuff, um, analytics, WooCommerce, uh, something that we usually have in most of our sites. Uh, the front page, page generation times are around 100, 100 milliseconds, and the, and the admin side of around 200. Uh, and if here we uh, change the language to f finish, uh, we almost double the page generation time. So this is not uh, the server response time, this is the time that PHP spends on generating the time page. And on the admin side, there is also a, quite a bump. <coughs> uh, so if you have uh, ever done a performance profiling on our WordPress site, you probably know that there is a slow player in the house, and that's a function called load text domain. Uh, the, by default, the load text domain uh, handles all the MO file parsing uh, so that the WordPress can use the translations that are on the MO files. Uh, but by default, uh, WordPress loads all the available text domains. So uh, if you have uh, 20 
plugins, it loads the all text domain for all the plugins. And then for the theme and core and for all the things. Even in the front end, we usually use one text domain, the text domain for the theme. Um, so that's something we can do better. Um, also, the translation files seldomly change, so that sounds like a potential target for caching. So, what if uh, we make these optimizations and uh, load only the text domains we need and cache the text domains? Uh, on the zero blocking version, uh, we end up having only three millisecond difference to the original one. And in, on the admin side, we can uh, also split the difference in half. Uh, but what uh, I think is the most important number here uh, is that uh, when you have this close to real world situation, uh, we can almost cut off all the overhead, overhead that's in the load text domain. And even on the admin side, we get a quite nice difference. Uh, we've been running these kind of optimizations for a few years now. And on the average side, uh, we have seen something around 50 to 20% improvements in page gener generation times. Uh, so that sounds like a nice thing. So how to do this? Uh, there is a plugin called WP Performance Pack available. Uh, it has uh, this uh, text domain optimization features and also a few, few smaller other things. Uh, but if you don't like the other things, like we don't, uh, we, we have made only the cacheable text domain loading available in our GitHub account. Um, obviously, there is a gut, uh, small thing and small print available. Uh, so to actually have the real performance improvement, you need an object cache backend like Redis, Memcached, or APCU. Uh, but uh, any of these can actually uh, help and deliver quite the same performance. So, back to multilingual stuff and themes. Uh, language selectors. Uh, this is something that I wanted to give a back, bad example again. Um, there is only one good thing on uh, using flags as a language selector, and that is that they are small, so they don't take uh, that much space. Uh, since the, these are probably quite uh, easy to know what languages these national flags represent, uh, but if we add a few more, it comes a little bit harder. Uh, since the lower row is, matches all the same languages that are in the upper row. So no flags. Again, no flags. Easy one. Uh, then the language codes. Um, this is something I've seen lately a lot. Uh, and I think this is uh, like a 50-50 <laughs> good option. Uh, if you have uh, only a few languages, like usually here in Finland, we have Finnish, Swedish, and English, and maybe some other, but usually it's these three. Uh, it might be that this is good, en good enough. Um, but when we add more, this uh, isn't that clear that what these languages actually are. And, and here we have uh, Estonian, Russian, Greek, Turkish, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Hindi, and Arabic, and I think the last four are not even use this kind of alphabet to actually uh, represent their language. So, 
If you have uh, only a few languages, write down the full language names. And even if you, if you have more, you should use the full language names. That's the best one. Uh, last year we built uh, this site with quite a lot of languages. Uh, so we went on a trip and uh, stole the idea from PBC and uh, implemented this language selector that has uh, the English versions of the language and then also the native version of the language name. Uh, so especially for the ones using little different alphabet than we here use, um, they can recognize their own language. Then the last section of this talk is non-Latin alphabet. Uh, I've been uh, working with many sites during the last year that have languages with non-Latin alphabet and I noticed that there is quite a little information about this available. So that's why I wanted to tell you something about it. And the global share of Latin alphabet is only a one-third. So, so if, even it sounds a little far to think in here in Finland that we should care about something else. Uh, we should care. Uh, the rest, uh, big ones are Chinese, Devanagari, which is used in India, uh, Arabic and Kyrillic. Uh, and I think the Kyrillic is the one that uh, for, for geographical reasons comes up quite often. And the first thing on non-Latin alphabet are the web fonts. And I know this is a design thing. Um, but on my experience, you are the first one as a developer to think about this. And since I knew that there would be designers sitting here today, that number is only 90. And there must be some exception in the people of designers. So, um, in practice, did he, someone spends hours and hours picking up the nice font for the customer's site and they don't know that there will be languages without a Latin alphabet. So we end up having this kind of nice CSS rule for font families. Uh, then in the ideal world we have these nice nice headlines, but then we have a uh, Finn, Finnish person appearing on the site and adds a headline in Finnish. And we end up having mixed content. Uh, usually we, with the Nordic diacritics we don't have this issue since most fonts included them. Uh, but for example with the Kyrillic characters uh, this usually becomes an issue since they have a set of Latin alphabet and a set of non-Latin alphabet in their alphabets. So, so there usually is mixed alphabet and it's ugly to look. Uh, another example uh, is the Chinese. Uh, here we have a nicely choose serif for the word weather in English and Chinese. Uh, but if we take off the actual web font addition, we notice that the Chinese version of the word was already in times or the default serif font that's available. Um, so uh, often when we make the so, uh, a site with non-Latin alphabet, we don't actually notice that they are, they are not using the same font than, than the other uh, versions. And we are actually the, all the alphabets render correctly, but, but with the default font from the font stack. <clears throat> so what to do when we have 
non-Latin alphabet, is to make sure that we include the correct subsets uh, in our fonts. Uh, in TypeKit and Google Fonts, we can, you can choose for which languages or which subsets you use. And uh, I think uh, most of the web font vendors have these kind of selectors available when making up the web font kits. Uh, on another thing you, <coughs> as a developer, should uh, see this issue upcoming up front uh, and try to consider the, and make the design of think that there, there will be issues with the fonts later on if they haven't considered the some easy solutions we've used. Uh, there is a font called Noto Sans uh, that's developed together with Google and Adobe. Uh, it is uh, based on the Source Sans Pro font, um, and it's available in almost all the languages you can think of. And it's available at Google Web Fonts Early Access with many other fonts uh, with non-aligned alphabet. Uh, even if it's early access, you know what kind of beta, beta programs Google have, so I don't take that that's a problem. Transliteration. Business of getting rid of unwanted characters. Uh, this is something we don't actually kind of notice at all and we kind of used to it. Uh, WordPress does this by default. It replaces uh, non-ASCII, non uh, Latin alphabets on slugs. But what if we have uh, Chinese marks in the slug? Uh, it does nothing to them. And um, I think because we are actually transliterating the Nordic diacritics and as and ers and stuff like this, we should actually transliterate the other alphabet too. So here is a set of different plugins that handle the uh, transliteration for you. And the last thing is right to left. So from right to left. Um, Languages that you uh, use right to left are usually uh, Arabic, Hebrew, and uh, at least I've noticed that there has been a, a raising demand uh, of these right to left languages in sites, even here in Finland. Uh, this is something that WordPress does by default if you change the language to uh, a language that uh, uses right to left. Uh, and on, on the HTML path, this is the Im most important and nearly only thing you need to do. And what uh, you should then do? On the site, you should uh, move every element that was on the left side to the right side of the site. And uh, what was on the right side should go on the left side. So, uh, for example, we usually have the logo on the upper left corner, but on the uh, right to left, we should have it on the upper right corner. Uh, sidebar, that's on the left side, should be on the right side, and the content area, vice versa. Uh, and how do we achieve this? Uh, like uh, we have this uh, style.css on root of the theme, there is a place for rtl.css, uh, which is uh, automatically loaded if we have a language that is uh, right to left. And if you want to manually enqueue your right to left things, there is this function called isrtl that you can use. Uh, well, and what are the things we need in our styles to mirror our floats? Uh, all float lefts 
should be float right, and all float right should be float left. Uh, asymmetric mar margins, so here you have different margin on the left and right side, you should flip them. Same with paddings, uh, list styles. So uh, the, on the right to left uh, side, the list bullets are on the right side of the column instead of the left side. So they will, would be here and the text would be aligned on this edge. So you have to make sure that they work. And if you have some JavaScript that is direction aware, uh, like uh, masonries or sliders or something like that. <coughs> um, there is one nice exception to this, and that's uh, Flexbox. Uh, <coughs> by default, if you make uh, columns by using uh, Flexbox, uh, it takes them from left to right, uh, but uh, if you change the dir direction element uh, or attribute on the HTML DAC to right to left, uh, Flexbox automatically adjusts itself to this new order. So that's nice. Uh, that's all I have to talk to you today. So it's question time. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, questions? Over there? Uh, wait to get the mic, please. Hey. So you said that the performance of PO and MO files is bad, but the alternative is storing them in the database. That's faster? Sounds uh, yes. weird, but... Uh, the, uh, uh, from the both plugin pages that are there, there is a long story why it is. Uh, but the intention between the PO and MO files is, uh, has been using the native PHP get text extension, um, which supports the MO files. But uh, the get text is an extension and not shipped with all the installs of PHP. So instead of using that, uh, WordPress has the whole Mo parsing code in PHP on the itself, um, and that's slow. Uh, the WP performance pack author have has actually written the whole Mo parsing code uh, again from scratch since the WordPress version is <laughs> so bad, uh, and. Uh, the re result uh, with the caching is that uh, if you have the ob object cache available, you are actually storing the same array of translations in your memory. So uh, either you store the translation post object uh, from the database or the parsed array of strings from the MO file. But uh, to dig deeper on the issue, you, there is long stories <laughs> waiting for you behind the links. More questions over there? Uh, so I'm, to take this example, I'm setting up a brand new WordPress website. Which character set should I configure uh, WordPress to use? UTF-8, for example? Yes. Yep. Definitely. And for the database collation as well. So UTF general instead of Latin one. Uh, I think it depends on uh, if you have a f uh, languages that use Finnish, I think you should use the Swedish edition. So you get the alphabetical orders right from the MySQL. Yeah, the collation. Yes. Uh, more questions? Everyone wants to go home and for beer. <laughs> uh, how many people have a multilingual site? Uh, built a multilingual site over here. Like pretty much everyone. Um, there's a question over there. 
See, that was a trick to get people to like, exercise. <laughs> Raise your hand. Yeah. Not actually a question, but a uh, quick note. Uh, if you don't want to transliterate like the URLs, like you want the Cyrillic yes. alphabet for the URLs, there's actually one thing that WordPress does do. And what it does, it encodes the characters in the database. And there's a limit, like 250 <laughs> characters there. Ah, so you okay. don't have, like, if you want long URLs in Cyrillic alphabet, you have to take that into consideration. Uh, yes, and uh, I think uh, at least with the Chinese plugin, we uh, faced that uh, the this limit that uh, the Chinese word transliterations are long. So the plugin has uh, this uh, option where you can limit how long transliteration it will produce, so that we don't hit the limit. Any other questions? Well, yeah. Over there? Hi. Um, you mentioned about the non-Latin characters, like Arabic and Devanagari and uh, etc. Uh, and you also spoke about the fonts. So how do you think uh, a font should be loaded in a multilingual website where there are also non-Latin um, characters? Should it be all in one file as a web font? Or should it be separate? files for separate languages? Um, what we used with the uh, site I saw, showed you with the 13 di different languages, um, since the different fonts are, they are actually different fonts, uh, so not just the subsets of the same font, uh, we uh, include the style sheets for different font faces uh, separately. So, so a different style sheet for uh, each language, or especially uh, with Google Fonts, it's just a different Google Fonts link to all the different languages. Okay, one more question, if there are any. Okay, um, thank you very much, Janne. Thanks.